Hey, this is Bill Gladwell, and welcome to episode number 18 of the Hey, Look at Me podcast. This episode, I talk to comedian and magician David McCreary. I believe the first time David and I met was at a hypnosis training event I was conducting, and he happened to find himself in front of the group as my subject, and we have been friends ever since. David has been performing for more than 15 years, and people always leave scratching their heads in disbelief and holding their sides from laughter. Via Skype, David and I talk about his bodyboard skills, mixing stand-up and magic, growing hairband hair, getting started in magic and comedy, why comedy works well in magic, being an entertainer first, getting booked, promotion, hell gigs, recovering when something goes wrong on stage, and what you should always have with you. If you haven't already subscribed to my podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes and Stitcher, and when you do, leave a five-star review. I would really appreciate it. You can follow me on Twitter at Bill Gladwell, and you can jump on my website with any questions or comments at BillGladwellLive.com. So enjoy episode 18 of the Hey Look at Me podcast. <laughs> yes, you can. I can't see you, though. I just got a picture of you uh, with cards in your mouth. What? <laughs> <laughs> Which is not a big deal. All right. So... You ever did a podcast before? Oh. Uh, oh, well, we're on, so we're all good. It sounds like we, we know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Good. And there may be some lag between, uh, since we're doing this over Skype, between uh, what I say and what you say, but we'll work it out. Oh, sweet. Ah, uh, man, last time I saw you, by the way, we're talking to David McCreary. And David, did you get a chance to listen to any of the podcast? Yes, I did. And it's good stuff. I'm impressed. Proud of you, young man. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, well, you know what the podcast is about then. So we don't really have a format other than uh, maybe to give support to people coming into the business or that people are new to the business and they're uh, getting started right. to show that everybody else uh, goes through the same stuff and then maybe give some tips. Love it. It's good thinking. And it's I, good I, I know. And I was thinking about it before I uh, got a hold of you on Skype here that I don't know if we've ever talked about how you got started. So we might want to hit that at some point. But the last time I saw you... I think it was in, uh, was it, it was like a year ago with, remember Greg Pruitt we had at a restaurant? Yeah, that Mexican restaurant. Yeah, and the first thing that you said to me is, said, what the hell happened to you, is what, is what you said <laughs> when you came in. <laughs> to you? Yeah, to, yeah, you said you, that to me. Yeah, you leave to, on a, what seemed like a spur of the moment thing, and you end up with your own show down in Gatlinburg. <laughs> Which I'm, <laughs> I know, I'm not even there anymore. I know. You've moved on to bigger and better places. Yeah, Hilton Head Island. Nice. Yeah, I was waiting for you to come down and visit this summer. I know. I still I still need to. I mean, the summer's over, so I guess I have to come down this fall. You did go someplace, though. You went to, uh, where'd you go, Outer Banks or something? Myrtle. Myrtle. Is that like the Redneck Riviera? Uh, probably a couple steps below a Redneck Riviera. <laughs> 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 and nobody from your party... Got eaten by a shark or bit or anything? No, but I was out there because I'm a man. I don't even care. I was scared at one point. I got uh, I got <laughs> taken out by uh, the uh, riptide. Oh I, yeah. I had a boogie board with me, so I wasn't I wasn't afraid of drowning or anything. But I'm kicking and and I'm not moving forward towards the 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 beach at all, and I'm starting to freak out because I'm like, you know, from underneath as I'm laying on this boogie board, kicking and all that. I'm. I probably look a lot like a seal, uh, and not like the navy kind. I'm talking like the dinner kind. I, would, <laughs> I, I was. I was scared there for a second, thinking I was going to get a get a shark upside the the side. But no, all worked out. I'm fine. You okay. know what? What? My, if I get if I get eaten by a shark, the shark. I'm going to poop my pants. So the shark's going to be eating my poop. So jokes on you, shark. <laughs> That's right. I had a I had a kid. He must have been about fifteen or sixteen uh, in the club down here in Hilton Head, and uh, he had his finger bandaged up. So I asked him what happened, and he uh, he got bit by a shark. Really? Like a see see that's you got to just you make fun of that kid. I did because did. I asked him how he got bit, and he said uh, I was taking the hook out of its mouth. <laughs> so that's stupidity. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Uh, so how did you uh, now what do you bill yourself as I know you're a, a magician but do yeah. you bill yourself as a stand up also kinda I, I I should because I think people understand that more than just if I say I'm, I do comedy and magic I just book myself as a stand up and then if they ask like what what style I say I do I do magic you know so 
I right now I just I just book myself as the comedy and magic of David McCreary. Uh, but I should I should because I do so many different things, you know, I do the, the strolling man, which still has a lot of humor in it. Just because I'm not on stage doesn't mean I can't make people laugh. Uh, so if I'm if I'm standing around a cocktail table and, and doing magic for them, I still want people laughing and having a good time. So, um, yeah, I do, you know, I do the stand-up stuff. I do the strolling stuff. So, yeah, I guess I am a stand-up, um, but I do mostly corporate events than, uh, than like, comedy clubs. Okay. And you do, do you do a lot of comedy clubs? No, actually, I don't do many. I did here in Columbus, Ohio. I did, did uh, like a thirteen-week run where they had me opening up. They were doing a television series called Bananas, and they had me like warming up the crowd even before the host of Bananas started. Uh, and so I would do some of my. I ended up doing like ten minutes beforehand and ten minutes after the show, and I would do. Uh, I would write new material for the first ten minutes of the show. And I loved it. I had a blast doing it. But then I do magic at the end of the show. The problem with with my stand up show is, you know, at a lot of comedy clubs, probably most comedy clubs, you have people sitting off directly to your left and your right. And with me being magic and people needing to see what happens, a lot of those folks won't see the magic happen because they're off to my side. You can see it from the front. Uh, I, you know, I could go in and try to rework my stand up show and my magic so it would work for the folks on the side, but I. I I still think the people sitting off to the side, no matter how much I work on it and try to make it better as far as visibility wise, I still think it's gonna it's gonna suck for them. So I haven't really focused on comedy clubs that much. So what came first, the comedy part or the magician part? Uh, as far as like entertainment and and really you know working and and making money at it, it was definitely the magic. Oh wait, wait, the long hair rocket oh, yeah. part came first. Yeah, that, well, yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I had the long hair when I started my magic. I had hair to my waist. Uh, now, I still have hair to my waist, but it's actually growing out of my back now as I get older. <laughs> now, were you in a band? I was. Mid-90s, 95, 96, just a local band here in Columbus. We were we were terrible. I was the lead singer, and you know, I got the gig because I looked like a rock star i couldn't sing to save my life i have no idea why they they asked me to do it other than i kind of looked like a rock star that is awesome what was the name of it freak show freak show yeah <laughs> kind of a stupid name too it's just not that original and although i did i met my wife with the long hair so uh she really she dug the long hair well, how did you end up cutting it? Did it just move on? You didn't want it anymore? Or did she decide? Yeah, to... I didn't start cutting it until probably '96, and I uh, I cut a little bit at a time, maybe maybe a few inches at a time, because there was no way. I mean, I was really attached to it. I started growing it in '88 and started cutting it in '96, so a little bit at a time, and and uh, you know '96 long hair, the hair bands is what I grew up listening to. That's why that's why I grew the hair out. Molly Crew, Poison, bands like that. I. Uh, I thought, you know, I just, it's just not as hip as it was. I got to just, I got to get rid of it, but I couldn't do it all at once. I cut a little bit of time. So over, over probably two years, maybe, maybe a little less than that. I slowly cut it to, to normal, normal length now. Man, when I first saw that picture of you, I thought it was Photoshopped. Yeah, that's the funny thing is a lot of people that, that meet me after, like meet me now and I show them that picture. They're like, there's no way that's real. And then there's people that, that see me now that haven't seen me for years are like, dude, I don't even recognize you with short hair. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's absolutely not photoshopped. It's the it's the real deal. W when did you start magic, or when did you start comedy? How did you know you were funny, and how did you know you could do? <clears throat> well, stuff? I was going back to Myrtle Beach. I was in Myrtle Beach. I didn't start doing magic until I was twenty. Uh, I liked it. I think all boys at some point go through a magic phase whether they do it or they just really really like it you know i grew up watching copperfield so those were my memories of magic growing up but uh i was 20 on vacation in myrtle beach and went to barefoot landing walked into a shop there and i think still there i think it's called conley's something like that and uh saw a guy doing some stuff making some things disappear and i think did did a couple card tricks and i thought i want to be able to do that i want I want people. I want to be the center of attention, and I knew that would that would help. So, uh, bought a couple tricks there. Came back. I was working at Ticketmaster at the time, and uh, did a did a couple tricks for people there. And somebody there at Ticketmaster said, "You know, there's a magic shop right around the corner from here, right?" 
And uh, I had no idea, but there turned out there was. It was back in like an office complex. And uh, started going. Was that Kleins? Yep, Steve Kleins. Okay. Uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, it's one hobby that stuck, I think. And I don't know if it's because I, uh, I, I got into it late, so no other hobby came along afterwards to take my mind off of that. But um, I like the fact that, you know, I like being the center of attention. So uh, having, having the ability to walk into a party with a deck of cards and, and people want to see me and see what I do. It's kind of cool, so I think that that's also one reason why it really stuck as a as a hobby that's now you know helping to pay the bills. Um, as far as the comedy, I think you know I did magic for about three or four years, maybe about three years before I got to the point where I'm like, I uh, I think I can make money doing this. I Steve Klein, same guy that owned the magic shop, called me one night. I was with my wife, who was actually my girlfriend at the time, and. Uh, he called and said, hey, can you fill in for me at the restaurant tonight, which was where he was doing table hopping. And I thought I, – I came up with an excuse not to do it. I don't remember what the excuse was. But I, said, oh, I just can't do it. So I hung up and Tab, my wife, says uh, – she's like, who was that? I said, Steve, he wants me to do magic at his shop. And uh, she said, well, why aren't you doing it? I said, because that's terrifying. There's no way I'm going to do magic in front of people. And she's like, you do magic in front of all your friends and all the family and you fool all of them. Go out and do some magic. Get paid for it. So uh, I called Steve back. Ended up going out. The first table that I walked up to, uh, you know, it was at Skyline Chili, which if you don't know what Skyline Chili is, uh, it's, a, it's a fast food kind of Coney dog, chili dog type place. So you get your food pretty fast. It's the best place in the world. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> so, um, so I go up to the table. You know, you, even though it's fast food, it's you sit down and they come and take your order. But it's five minutes maybe to get your food. So I, I see a, a mom and her son sitting there, and I walk over, and I ask to do a trick for him. I do this trick, and it's it's the plot Magician in Trouble, where uh, it looks like you screw up, but end up you, you nailed it. You got the trick right, but it, for a second there, people think you messed up. So just as I, I screw up the trick, supposedly screw up the trick, I go to reach and turn over a card that they think isn't theirs, but it's supposed to be, and it's not their card. So I really did screw up. And just as I screwed that up and they're like, no, that is not our card. The lady walked up behind me and gave them their food. So <laughs> I walked away uh, with doing absolutely no magic. I kind of just showed them a bunch of cards and did nothing with them. It was, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a shock that I, I stuck with it even after that, because that was, that was traumatizing to, to, <laughs> to walk up to a table, do a trick that's super easy and screw it up like that. And then just kind of stare at me like this was, this was terrible. Is that, so, is that where the comedy part comes in at? Well, it, you know what? It actually, it kind of does. I didn't add it right then and there, but uh, man, it's so comedy is such a good misdirection with magic. Uh, there's a couple reasons. Number one, it's a good misdirection. So if I have people laughing and I need to do a secret move, if they're laughing, they let, they've let their guard down, uh, and and it's entertaining. <laughs> laughing is just fun. So uh, you use it as misdirection. You use it just because it's fun. But also nowadays. Any trick I do, some young punk can go home, get on YouTube, and find out how to do the trick. You know, there it's all over YouTube. You know, anything I do, they can eventually find out how it's done. So my goal is to number one, I need to do magic well. So even when they see it explained, they're like, "There's no possible way that could have been how he was doing that," because that I didn't see any of that. But at the same time, even if they do figure out how it's done, I still want them to be entertained. And the laughter and the comedy uh, serves that purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if we haven't spoken for a while. So, I, I, you know I'm the manager of the comedy club down here? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that has – and plus with the comedians coming in and doing the podcast and getting to spend four days with each comedian, it's uh, right. really upped my show quite a bit because when I moved down to Gatlinburg, Tennessee and st opened up my mentalism show, it was a very serious, boring show. And uh, we, it was a weird combination because people coming into Gatlinburg weren't as sophisticated as other places of the country. Uh, and so they didn't see, they hadn't seen a mentalism show before, so they didn't have anything to compare it to. So I was getting high reviews and I got to tweak my show as the three years went on. Right. And then when we moved down here, um, I got placed into the position of being the manager of the comedy club as well as doing my show there three or four nights a week and emceeing and hosting the comedians. 
And so I had to come up really quick with, uh, you know, a, a short 30 minute thing that I could do to MC and host as the comedy night went on. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, the first few comedians I made friends with quite a few and they've given me tips and the show is now actually there is, there are laugh points about every minute all the way through the show in, uh, in my show, in my 75 minute show now. So it is important. I, I see a lot of, and it's a joke I make on other podcasts. It's, it's, and which isn't really a joke. It's that if you go, I walked out of Kreskin because I thought he sucked. Yeah. And I see other mentalists and there's a few out there. Like I love watching Banachek and I think you and I went over to Pennsylvania to see Banachek yep. that one time. I'm lecture that one day. Yeah. So Banachek is good. And, uh, and there's a few others, um, that, well, Darren Brown, for example, but they, they're not just mentalists. They're also, they know the entertainment side of things. So, and that's what a lot of magicians and entertainers in general, but a lot of magicians and mentalists don't get. Exactly. I mean, and it was that way for me when I first started out. I all I thought was I just need to learn these tricks, and and everybody will love me. And it got to the point where I thought, you know what, I this for me is about entertainment, and I'm going to use magic as a tool to entertain people. Another tool is the comedy. Another tool is just personality, just being wanting to be around where people are like, this guy is fun. You know, maybe not even at times not even funny, but just fun to be around. Um, and it's very important if, if people are going to, I could be the best magician in the world, but if I have no personality, people are going to get bored quickly. And there are people out there like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love watching magic, but if, if I see somebody that has, like I said, no personality and it's just trick after trick after trick, eventually I'm going to get to the point where I'm like, okay, I just, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> I got to get out of here. This is dry. <laughs> so yeah, I, th- I think comedy is very important. And then not to take away from the magicians that are out there that are that do a serious thing. Um, you know, if they have a show and their and their character is serious, that's okay. But still, have personality in that seriousness. Like, yeah, that's right. Did do you watch uh, Penn and Teller's Fool Us? Oh yeah, I don't miss it. No, yeah, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he did the thing with the uh, smoke and the cards. Yeah, that's Shin Lim. That's right. Yes, I couldn't remember his name, and he's not funny, but he it's the best. Uh, routine i think i've seen right and he's still even though most of his act was completely silent there's still personality coming from it you know i don't know how to explain it but it's just it's not necessary it's man it's there's such a fine line between uh kind of like a hey look at me look what i do i'm better than you and just being good at what you're doing and Uh, he's very good way yeah and and that's the name of the podcast by the way hey look at me for that very reason because (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which I like people looking at me. <laughs> so, are you? Uh, were you always funny? I and what, what? Well, I guess I'm asking that as like class clown or anything funny yeah. or okay. I wasn't. I, I this is ridiculous. I got voted best hair my senior year. <laughs> Get class clown. Um, but I was I was I was a nerd up until my senior year. I started letting my grow my hair grow um, uh, during my junior year. So. The, the summer between junior and senior year it grew pretty long and you know we're talking back in, in the heyday of the hair bands motley crew poison warrant all those guys so when i go back to school my senior year i looked like one of those guys and so i got out of my nerdiness but because of my nerdiness i was more concerned with people not thinking i was goofy so i i wouldn't try to be super funny i was funny but i was i didn't look for it like i do now now, what's the uh, so when when was your first paying gig? Was it with that one that Klein sent over to you? Yeah, yeah, that was my first like paid strolling gig. And then, as far as like the stand up, I was working for Lucent Technologies. Uh, this was mid mid nineties, maybe towards the end of ninety seven, maybe. And uh, I was we were doing a a, a quality celebration, not equality quality so like different different uh areas inside this plant where i worked uh we we built circuit packs and that kind of thing but uh we all got together and celebrated the quality of the product that we put out and different teams that put different different um uh, uh steps into producing good quality material anyways we all got together and we uh rented out a movie theater probably 300 people there and uh, I needed to be, they needed an MC. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll be the MC. 
So that thought, okay, I've got five MC bits. I do magic. What magic do I do? What magic tricks do I have that I can make bigger to pay for the entire room? And so I did that with like five tricks and it went over great. It went over really good. I mean, part of that is because, you know, we were all at work for the day and we weren't at work that day. We were out having this kind of party. And uh, so people are already in a really good mood. But I thought this this is fantastic. I got all these people in the palm of my hand and I'm just doing a couple of the tricks that I did, you know, table to table for, for two or three years now. That's nice. Now, when, yeah. you're, when you're starting out, how do you find gigs? Oh, that is... Paying good. gigs. Yeah, paid gigs. Well, that's the thing. I think you, you've you got to... You, man, it's been so long. You obviously have to start out, uh, I think, just taking any gig you can get. And if, if uh, you know, there's so many different budgets. I still, to this day, I will get invited to a, a house party. And I know it's going to be 20 people there. It's, you know, all family members throwing a birthday party. And, and if it's a Wednesday night and I'm not doing much, um, I will charge them less than what I would charge, you know, Chase Banks, you know, Chase were to call me out there. And here's the thing. I should be listening to people talk about this more than talking about it myself because my marketing is absolutely terrible. Um, I've got uh, uh, an agency that books me here in Columbus and uh, they do a good job, but they, they kind of wait for people to call them like, Hey, we're looking for an MC or we're looking for a comedy actor. Uh, and then the that, that's me. a, that's a normal agency. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and what I'm saying is it's an agency and it's not, I don't have an agent going out looking for work for me right now, which is what I, I really need. I really need to step up my game. Um, I, you know, there's so many events out there. I, Here's here's how terrible I am. There's a there's a networking organization in Columbus, and like two years ago, I signed up for it because uh, you get invited to networking events, and I went to a couple of the networking events and just strolled into some magic and set up a booth, passed out business cards, and that was fun. But they also send out material like um, information on companies that are coming to the convention center here in town and having uh, having events and, and conferences and, and trade shows, and they send this out. And I didn't do a thing with it. I got no gigs from Experience Columbus, not because it's not great, but because I'm just terrible with that kind of thing. And I need to get a lot, lot better. It drives me crazy to sit around on a Saturday night thinking I could be out working right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, how easy or hard is it to get an agent? I mean, you found yours fairly early, but how did you find them in the first place? Uh, I think through, through one of the other magicians, uh, they, uh, Steve Klein, same guy, going back to the same guy that owned the magic shop and got me my first gig. He mentioned them to me at one point and I called them. I remember going in and, uh, just doing a little bit of magic for them at the, uh, at, sitting around a conference table in their, in their office. And, uh, they liked it. And they first, like I said, they first started booking me just as a strolling magician. <clears throat> and then, um, you know, I told them I got a stand up show and they started booking that and MC work and, and, uh, they do. They do good stuff. I think if you look up, uh, you know, wherever you are in the country, if you if you Google, I almost said if you look up in the yellow pages, good grief, <laughs> old. Uh, you look up talent agents in your area. Um, hey, this is what I'm doing, and and if you have to, you know, you tell them I'm 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 fairly new at this, so I'm a little cheaper for companies to call and say, hey, we don't have a lot of money. Uh, what can what can we get for you know X amount? And uh, you know, just slowly start into it and work work. Uh, uh, Work any event you can find. Any event you can find. If it's a, if it's a fair in town and they're looking for entertainment, you know, get hold of them. And uh, the more you're in front of people, uh, the better your show is going to be. Like you, like you were just mentioning, you, you, your show right now has to be fantastic. You're doing three or four shows a week. Well, yeah, but I'm doing. Yeah, that's right. It's it's grown so much because when I was in Gatlinburg, I did three or four shows a week, and when I moved down to Hilton Head. I do three or four 75 minute shows a week, but I do uh, 30 to 35 minutes the other night. So seven nights a week I'm doing, I'm on stage. Holy moly. Yeah. Now it's, it's going to calm down now because the tourists are beginning to leave the island, but right. uh, I'll still be doing um, at least three or four nights a week. So it, it, you can add new stuff and you can tweak new jokes and you can do it really quick over a period of like five days and have it ready, which is unheard of in any situation because you have to wait until you get back in front of people when, to do that. That's awesome. So, and it's also cool for you because you're in that touristy spot, which means uh, an audience that changes constantly. 
Yeah, it is. It's always a new audience. And I, I have locals that bring back friends. I got one lady that has come back four times in the past three weeks uh, with awesome. new people that she's brought in. And uh, so that's that's always a compliment. I, I know I, I could never get an agent. Um, I did. I, I approached the agency that you're with several times and uh, they just, you know, at the time I didn't have any printed material uh, that okay. I really handed out. And it was just it. You know, they, they like me. It just wasn't anything that they would push. And after I got down in Gatlinburg, I got hired to do a show back up in um, Sydney, Ohio. And uh, she actually came over, and your your agent actually came over with with her husband and sat through the show. And she did. She tries. She's trying to book me now, but we did, nothing has ever gone through. I don't think they know how to sell exactly what I do. Yeah, uh, that's that's a good point. Yeah, and so we uh, we started getting calls. Here's what I did. This is I got down to Gatlinburg and I did that myself. I went into uh, several theaters and I finally found one and they booked me and uh, for a long-term stay. Um, and I was there for three years. And at that point, about a year into it, agencies began to call me because they had heard about my name. And I could never get an agent to pick up a phone before when I called them, but now they're calling me or emailing me. And uh, which was nice, which I never needed them then. But I've had a couple college gigs that uh, they called and I don't even know how these people hear about me other than they know that I had a theater show. And I wanted to move the show for a couple of reasons. Number one, our son had so many allergies that he needed to be on a coast is what the doctor allergist said. So we had to move him. But also I wanted to move to a higher class area. Yeah. And so we were looking at uh, several places and, and uh, Hilton Head Island was the first one to drop actually. So we moved down here and I had sent, uh, not this past February, but a February of 2014, uh, sent out an email to five different agencies saying, listen, I need to move my show and I want to move it down to a uh, coastal region and I will give you a percentage of the first year's income, net income, if yeah. you can find me a place, <laughs> which wasn't, it, it was, uh, you know, they were probably looking at somewhere between 40 and $50,000 is what they were looking at. And none of them responded. None of the four or five responded. So I sent out a couple months later, a follow-up email to everybody. And again, nobody responded. And this was probably around June when I sent that out of 2014. So I move, I found this place and I don't know if David, if you know how I found it, but I came down to Hilton Head Island just on vacation uh -huh. for, for a weekend. And uh, cause I had a gig in Greenville, South Carolina. And I went to Kerry Pollock's show who was here. And oh, nice. uh, yeah, and he was doing a show and I, I got a chance to talk to him afterwards. I stuck around, talked to him and Kelly. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, I'm, I'm out of here. This was the second week of December. He goes, I'm out of here at the end of the month. He said, I'm going to get my own place. I said, oh, where, where are you going? And he told me I'm going to cross the street and stuff, and it's going to be a restaurant. And anyways, he told me what he was going to do. So on the way back home, I asked my wife, I said, would it be bad of me to call the owners of the place he's in now to see if he would, uh, or if, if they're looking for somebody? And she goes, no, I don't think that's bad. He's already leaving. It's not like you're kicking him out. Right. So, so that's what I did. I called. And they, what they told me was this, no, we're just going to have uh, comedians in here now. We're going to have a comedy night. We really don't want another uh, house act because uh, Carrie's a magician. If nobody knows, listen to this. And they, they didn't want another house act. And I said, that's fine. I said, but before you give me a definite no, take a look at my TripAdvisor reviews and take a look at my website. And a look at the reviews on that and what I do and the videos. So they did. And about two hours later, they had called me back. And uh, by the end of the following week, I had a contract for Hilton Head Island. Nice. So that's how I got down here. And uh, anyways, I got down here and they found out that I could do more than just entertain. So they put me as manager of the comedy club. And I'm working with an agency, mm -hmm. an agency that they had in place to bring in the comedians every week. And uh, I got a call about two weeks after being down here saying, hey, I, we're going to be working together. He goes, I got to apologize to you. He said, listen, I, uh, I, I found that we had an email buried from you from about a year ago. And... Uh, we never responded, and you know that's not like how I I don't like to do business that way. I don't think I've ever told this on a podcast before, so hopefully <laughs> if they hear this, they won't get upset. So they, right. they said, uh, you know, we, we it got buried, and uh, we really apologize for that. And I said, no, that's okay. I said you saved me like forty to fifty thousand dollars. I I found it myself, so I kind of huh. gave them a little punch back. Yeah. But but now, uh, you know. They gave me a list of things that I needed, and uh, so I put together like a one sheet, uh, which I needed. I put together a writer. I put together uh, all my references from other corporate events that I had, and uh, the only thing I don't have 
is a video and I need a, a two minute, you know, one and a half, two minute video somewhere around there. And I've never had one. Um, it's a joke that I've told on other podcasts and I, I tell anybody this that asked that I started doing corporate events a long time ago with my stage comedy hypnosis show. Huh. And if they asked for a video, I would send them at the time a blank videotape. Then it was a blank DVD and nobody ever said anything except for one person said it didn't work. And they said, but it's too close to the date. We'll go ahead and hire you anyways. But nobody ever watched those things. But now, so I'm putting together, people do watch them now, though, because they're online. Well, yeah, you get online now. Yeah, yeah. so I am uh, putting together a video now. Luckily, my brother-in-law is, uh, he was a film major. Now he works in film, so he's putting one together for me. And uh, so it should be pretty good, but we'll see. Yeah, and, and um, I've got that are really, really good at the, at uh, all that type of stuff. And I, so I just, I need to do the same thing. Man, yeah. I'm telling you, and you want it to be different, I think, because I looked at other mentalists and I looked yeah. at other magicians, and uh, they're it, they're really crappy. Most of them are really crappy. Yeah, and it's all kind of the same thing. I feel like uh, when you watch one, you've seen them all. You know, it's kind of these quick clips, one-liners, magic cards, and that not not taking anything away from the performer. They may be great performers, but. The, there's got to be more, and it's you know one of the things I thought of doing is actually putting together a two minute, um, almost commercial that tells a story, and 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 actually sit down and write a promo, uh, and have some fun with it and think outside the box. Um, so I may I may do that. I've got I've got friends like I said that would be more than willing to help and jump on that. It would come out fantastic. Uh, I just need to do it. <laughs> no, I think that's a good idea because we might want to talk offline about that because that's exactly what I'm doing. We're writing a script out and we're planning the whole thing, and yep. uh, we want to get a really good video. And I want to I want to have a feel. You, you're familiar with the Dollar Shave Club? Oh yeah, yeah. I want it to have a feel of something like the video that they have. Yep. And uh, it, it should be good. So yes. what what is uh, what's the worst gig you've ever done? Oh man, that's awesome that you asked that. I uh, it was back early on. I'd already started doing the stand up stuff. Uh, got called from um, Columbus Library. So I don't know what the the official title was, but uh, they were having an outing, a big outing for Columbus Libraries at a bowling alley here in Columbus. I thought, okay, sounds good. They wanted me to do thirty minutes of stand up and some strolling stuff. So I go, and this is, like I said, this is early on, so I don't know exactly how to, you know, what to ask for to make sure they have all this stuff in order. But I go, assuming they have a room reserved, like a banquet room at the bowling alley, and they don't. They've got two lanes reserved, <laughs> and they need to do magic out on, like, where you approach with the golf, or with the golf ball. I just golfed this morning. With a bowling ball, do magic standing out there with the public bowling on either side of me, Muzak playing on the on the speaker above me, and they want me to stand out there and do magic while they all sit up where you have to stay with your drinks and stuff. And, uh, you know, I got, I got one trick into it, and I'm like, guys, I'll be honest with you, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm just going to walk around and do close-up stuff for you. And I was I was kind of angry because it seemed to me really stupid that they would book something like that and not have a room. But you know, I realized it was more on me than anything else because if they've never if they've never hired a magician before, they don't know exactly what they're doing. And so I learned through that terrible experience that uh, I need to walk people through, through uh, what the whole night needs to look like with me as a performer. So uh, it came out as a learning experience, but it was it was terrible standing out there in those bowling alleys doing magic with people. You know, the closest person was 20 feet from me, and I had to talk over the music. I had to talk over the people bowling on either side of me. It was, it was pretty funny. That's a really fun gig. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I did my writer for because so many times I'd get into situations that it wasn't, conducive to performing at all so the writer kind of spells it out for him now and i went to i mean just even just last year uh, i had a show here in, in ohio and uh, i look up the banquet hall that it's at can't remember the name of the company but i i uh look at pictures of banquet hall and they've got a stage they got a picture from the stage looking out over a huge dance floor and i can tell that on either side of this dance floor the dance floor is about 45 feet across but on either side they have tables set up so i'm like okay i need to call my agent and tell them to get hold of these people and tell them that no matter what they do they need to make sure to set up on the dance floor right in front of me 
I mean, because I, I knew they weren't going to do any dancing. Uh, so why not set up there? Because I don't want to stand on stage facing an empty dance floor with people off to my left and to my right. So my agent called them, told them what needed to happen, and I got there, and things were just like they were in the picture. Nobody in front of me. I'm backed up against the wall. I got people clear to my left, almost almost behind me. And uh, so I had to I had to think quick. And even even though I told them the media change that they, they, they want to book me again this year, which I don't understand why. Maybe it's just because I know how good the show can go and how, how good the show can look that I, I compare it to that. Um, but it was really, really frustrating to do my show to an empty, empty floor with people off my left and right. Uh, so even writers, I, you got to be very, seems like very adamant. Not that I had a writer, but like I said, my agent called them and told them, this is what we need to do. And they didn't. So yeah, it'd be frustrating. Uh, yeah, that sucks. Uh, I've been in situations like that before. <laughs> you have to, you have to improvise. You have to make it work, which you know, I usually do. Other than the the bowling alley, I've always done my show. And then sometimes, you know, it doesn't work out great. There's been times when I've never had anybody complain about a show, but I've I've lost sleep at night when I get home thinking that was. Uh, I wake up in the middle of the night, and be like that was terrible. And uh, it's funny because I'll talk to people later that have that saw the show. I'm like, oh, it was so great. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. That was not a good show. No, I've never laughed so hard in my life. I'm like, I was angry most of the time I was up there on stage. How <laughs> did you laugh? So there is a yeah. bit by you know Pat Oswalt. Oh yeah. Did you have you heard his magician? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I did that last night. I I did it last night, and I didn't realize it until after I got off stage in, in summer. My wife told me about it. Um, we That's the audience I had last night was a little uh, rough, and and, and coincidentally the problems that I were have was having was with uh, the 12 people that were from Ohio. Uh, <laughs> so they were from Whitehall. Oh geez. Right down the road from me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, they, well, for, I call people on stage. I use about 22 victims is what I call them in my show. Right. And I started calling out of their group and, and they wouldn't come up. They said, no, we're not coming up. Uh -huh. And so that's how it started. So I, I started doing, and I didn't realize I was doing it. I said, uh, I ended one thing with, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I've had a chest cold. You're making it start laughing and start coughing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I, I And so when you have those nights, let me ask you this. Because huh? I, I, this happens to me. I mean, I do, I have a similar format I do for the 75 minutes. Um, it's different since I'm, I do the mentalism and mind reading, uh -huh. it, it is a different, every, every, everything, every bit that I do throughout that 75 minutes is different every night because we have different people thinking of different things, but it's a similar format. Right. And I screw it up sometimes. I, I screw things up during that. Uh, maybe something will go wrong with, uh, something that is, a like, a I don't know, maybe a notebook is out of paper or something. Something will go wrong and, and I, stupid me forgot to check that off before I started the show that night yep. or it's just something that I do wrong. I, I have a wrong stage direction or I just, I, I completely forget my line um, and I have to recover. So have you been in those situations in the hand? How do you, you said you had to wing it when the tables were on the sides of the stage, but during yeah. the performance, when it's your fault, how do you, how do you recover from that? So the audience doesn't notice. Well, that's, that's, it was not too long ago i do a uh i do a card stab and this was just me screwing up the trick kind of and i didn't forget anything there's there's time there's been times when i've forgotten props and i'll just move to another trick the cool thing is if people don't know how the trick is supposed to end they don't know that it didn't end the way i wanted it to as long as it still kind of ends entertainingly or magically i'm okay um you know i I'm, I'm, may not be happy with it but i i, I get by uh, but this day I was the trick. I have cards laid out on, on the table. I put a newspaper over, over the table and I'm already blindfolded. Actually, I have the person put the newspaper over the cards that are spread out on the table. And then I stab through the newspaper, pull the newspaper off. The knife is stabbed two or three cards. And the last card revealed on the knife is their signed card. Um, gets a good reaction, but this day I, I stabbed the cards, I pulled the newspaper away, and it wasn't their card. So I'm like, oh, dang it. So I start looking through the through the cards that are laying there. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, people are laughing because they think it's part of the show. They think it's part of the, 
you know, because I've I've done goofy stuff throughout the thing. I've screwed up a couple tricks, and it's gone ends up going right. You know, the magician in trouble thing again. And uh, so I go through, and I'm flipping cards over because they're face down, and their cards nowhere. And I know their cards nowhere because he signed it really big across the face of it, and there's no signed card laying there. And I said, I asked him, I said, did you really sign it? By this point, I'm I'm kind of losing it because I'm like I have no idea what just happened. So if the card was there, I could have weaseled my way out of it in one way or another, but I couldn't even find the card. So I, I tell folks, I said, folks, this, ta-da, I made the card disappear. I have no idea what's going on up here. And they're laughing, but nobody, I can tell that nobody believes that I really screwed the trick up. So, uh, you know, I, I cracked, I had a couple good jokes in there about never being invited back. And I don't remember exactly what I said, but, you know, it came out, it was still entertaining, even though I screwed the trick up because you got laughs in there um so at the end people are coming up and and uh and telling me that they like the show or and uh you know i'm just meeting people and one lady comes up and she goes i know where that card is and i said what do you mean she goes and that card that you couldn't find i know where it is i said where is it she says it's wadded up in the newspaper back on the back of the stage so i go back there and i open up the newspaper and there's the card with his name on it wadded up in the newspaper so when I pulled the newspaper away, I lifted the knife a little bit, and it took their card with it, and I crumbled it up and threw it. The only card left in there, and uh, oh. then I, I, you know, I was joking around with her. I'm like, "Why didn't you tell me?" And she goes, "Because I thought you were playing around. I didn't want to ruin your trick. <laughs> I thought I knew that it was back there, and something would happen." I'm like, "You know what? That I really respect the fact that you didn't say something." That I mean that that shows another level of thinking on her part to think, you know what, he's this is part of the trick. I don't want to ruin it by telling him it's back there. I'm in on this. I understand what's going on, even though that's not what was going on. I wasn't playing around. I really lost it. She thought I was. And uh uh so I thanked her. I said, thing, you know, I appreciate you not saying anything with it being the fact that you were, you didn't want to say anything because you thought it would screw up the trick. Yeah, those things happen, yeah. man. So, so- well, I usually end every podcast with uh, a tip uh, on the business side of things, though, because the number one thing, if anybody asks me to give them some advice, that's just getting into the business. Yeah. What I do is I tell them to be bold, but not on, I mean, you can do it on stage, but I'm talking about more off stage. What I mean by is call people that other people aren't calling and do things that other people aren't doing uh, because that's how you're going to get the business. You're going to stand out a little bit. So right. what what would be the tip from you? As far as magic is concerned, and this is coming from a guy like self-proclaimed terrible at marketing, um, always, always, always have – if you're a magician and you have a deck of cards and you do close-up stuff, always carry a deck of cards with you. Always have something ready to go. I will – I can still remember. I still do it to this day. I will secretly sneak in the fact that I'm a magician in conversations and – I would say 85% of the time when I work that into a conversation, I get them asking if I'll do a trick. And I'm going to absolutely do a trick because I want it to lead to something. You know, I want it to lead to a, a, a gig. A lot of times it doesn't. A lot of times they just want to see a magic trick, which is great. But, uh, you know, I, I hand them a business card and, uh, uh, you know, I put on a little show. I do, I do my best to, to fry them. And uh, what's cool is magic is so big right now on television so many people are really, really excited about seeing it up close and personal because they think even the David Blaine stuff, which isn't camera tricks, they think must be camera tricks. But when they see it right there in front of them, it floors them. And, uh, you know, I just I just always have magic ready to go uh, so that cause you never know who you're going to run into. And uh, it's always good to be ready to go. Yeah, that's really good. And I, I do carry a deck of cards around with me because I can do some mentalism things with the cards. Right. Right. And I do make a joke, so now I'm going to piss off all the magicians listening to this. Um, I use cards at one point during my show, which I might even pissed off some mentalists with this because some of them want to not use cards at all. Right. But at one point during the show, I use a deck of cards. And I ask a lady to think of a card, and then I tell her to hold on, and I turn the rest of the audience. I said, who has a deck of cards that I can borrow? And then it gets a laugh in the audience. And then I pull one out of my pocket. I said, nah, I have one. I knew we were going to do this. I said, but it's a good social experiment. If you go into a crowded room and you ask for a deck of cards and somebody gives you one, you know two things about that person. Number one, they're a magician. And number, uh, number two, they have no girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's awesome. So, <laughs> it's just so true. Too. And I, uh, it was funny because I, I do that every night. And uh, after the show one night, this guy comes up to me and he probably was in his mid fifties. And he says, look, and he pulled a deck of cards out of his pocket. He goes, I just didn't want to say anything. And he, <laughs> he, he, he was an attorney. He said, but I'm also a magician. So, <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. We need to be able to laugh at ourselves. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and Josh Jay, I just saw Josh, a friend of ours, uh, on yeah. uh, Penn and Teller's Fool. And he fooled him. Fooled him. I shot him off an email right after I saw that. I said, congrats. And uh, But he uh, he's from Columbus, so he made Columbus proud, I guess, huh? Yeah. Yeah, he fooled me. I Going into the trick, I told my wife the name of the trick that he was doing, and then he, he had the twist at the end where the, the card – at the very end, if you saw the trick at the very end, he turns their thought of card over and it's the only blank it's a it's the only card in a blank deck. I know that trick, uh, but it's not when I, when you flip the card over at the end, it's just a blank card and they're all blank. That's right. You, yeah, you still figure out what their card is, but you don't have it right there in front of them. Uh, so when he did that, that floored me. I was that's that is brilliant. I that's did the same thing. I did the same thing because uh, I I knew how it ended, and uh, even uh, Penn and Teller asked him about a Mark deck or not a Mark deck, a uh, a switching the deck. Yeah, and he said no, I didn't do that. And when he said that, I have no idea how he did it. So that was uh, that was brilliant. It was good. Yeah, and a lot of those guys going on there do know Penn and Teller. Or they've uh, at least did some things for them or uh, oh. helped them, and uh, so to fool them. Even though Penn and Teller knows their style, is pretty right. good. It's yeah, pretty. that's a great show. That, as far as magic, that and the Michael Carbonero show. Yes. Yeah, and he's down my way. He's over in Atlanta, I believe. Yeah, yeah, they shoot in, in Georgia. Yeah. Down there, right, probably right around where they shoot Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, should, you need to come down here. You can get into movies. Savannah's uh, like 50 minutes away. and It is? Are you serious? Oh, yeah, Savannah's only 50 minutes away from Hilton Head Island. Oh, wow. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and they shoot a lot of movies there. They just had De Niro and, uh, who else? De Niro and, um, somebody else was over there. Oh, uh, Efron. What's his name? Or Efron? Oh, Zach Efron. Zach Efron and, and De Niro was shooting a movie over there just recently. So dreamy. Yeah. <laughs> and not, they're no Ryan Reynolds, though. <laughs> <laughs> or Bill Gladwell. That's right. All right, Dave. Uh, thanks for uh, spending, uh, what did we spend? About, 50 minutes almost with this. So that really? sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Time flies good. when you're having fun. Oh, you know what? I don't want to hang up yet. Um, how do people get a hold of you if they want to contact you? Um, see, here's, I, I got the old fashioned yahoo.com uh, email address. So it's David Carl Magic, Carl with a C, David Carl Magic at yahoo.com. And uh, yeah, I got, I'm on Facebook, just David McCreary. Uh, there's also the comedy and magic of David McCreary, which is my, my fan page on facebook but once again i don't do a lot with it i do more with my personal stuff you know what after this has been a very enlightening conversation i need to step up my game <laughs> yeah i even bought you your domain remember that's right <laughs> good grief yeah that, that just goes to show how terrible i am at it i've done nothing all right well thanks a lot david thanks for having me man i'll all get right. down soon <laughs>